Morning, Cornerstone. Still good at the good mornings. That's good. <laughs> yeah, so I think you guys have already heard my name, but most of you know me from when I was just a, a little guy, <laughs> or either grew up with me, but for those of you who are unfamiliar with me, um, I work at Youth for Christ in Morden, which is connected to the local Youth for Christ here in, in Pilot Mound. Uh, we work uh, closely together. I get to um, supervise Tim Hildebrandt, who is the satellite director, and Lauren, who's the female program coordinator, and Susanna, who uh, comes from the, your church here, and we're really grateful to have Susanna as the summer student this summer. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a real pleasure to be able to come back home, uh, to be able to come and talk with you today, and <clears throat> I'm grateful for that. But not only am I grateful for this opportunity, so many of you have put the amount of money that come, has come out of this church, the amount of volunteer hours that has come out of this church for YFC Pilot Mound, and also for my personal support, um, for the support of those staff who are now in Pilot Mound, we're really grateful, and thank you so much for doing that, for taking your time and your hard-earned money and putting it towards that. Um, in YFC Morden, uh, I, I get to, I'm the ministry's director, and so I get to hear all the staff stories that filter back, uh, whether it's from Pilot Mound or Morden, and I can just tell you right now that there's some really cool things happening. Um, we have, uh, yeah, Lauren's doing a Bible study right now. She does uh, a Bible study in Pilot Mound and a small group in Morden with, and that does a Bible study as well. And the questions that come out of those conversations from kids who have never even stepped foot basically in a church before in their whole lives, who have no prior... Um, no prior information, maybe other than Netflix, <laughs> about who God is. Um, it's a beautiful thing. And uh, it was just just recently, um, one of the, there's a couple cool stories uh, staff are sharing with me. One of them was, <clears throat> we had a teen who's last week in Morden who asked for a Bible. Uh, and because we always give out free Bibles. And so they asked for a Bible, but they're heading up to Thompson this week. That's where... <laughs> Their dad lived, and they were going to go spend the week with their dad, but they still wanted to read their Bible. So I, I came in to the, <clears throat> the office of the staff member, uh, and she was watching Bible Project videos, trying to figure out which videos to send to this teen. And, and so she sends these videos to this teen, and this teen is so grateful because she's going to start reading through the Bible, starting with Mark, and they're going to be doing these Bible studies together. And this is a teen who's never read the Bible before in her whole life. And we're just grateful for the opportunities that you give us to be able to do that. Um, today I want to take us to the start of Matthew, the very start of the New Testament, and learn about the first things that Jesus spoke about. Matthew begins the story of Jesus's, begins the story in, that he tells in Matthew with Jesus' birth, and then his youth and his baptism by John, and then his temptation in the wilderness. And Jesus has only briefly said a couple words, and, and none of it preaching yet. And then in Matthew 4, 17, it says, From that time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And Matthew doesn't elaborate on that at all. He just keeps going. He gives no indication at first. He just mentions Jesus recruiting disciples, and then the large crowds who follow Jesus after Jesus is healing them. And then in chapter 5, verse 1, Matthew intros what we now call the Sermon on the Mount with the statement, Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He then gives us the Beatitudes. There are nine blessed are statements. And... We're going to zoom in on the first three blessed are statements today and try to understand what exactly, how exactly these words and passages connect to the Old Testament and what they rely on. 
So I'm just going to read, um, mostly going to be from the NIV this morning. Uh, so the first three are, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is right at the start of Matthew chapter 5. Uh, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Now, if you're like me, I often, when I read the Bible, I just assume, and I'm learning that this is not the right assumption more and more, but I often assume that this word um, that Jesus used is just, the English word captures perfectly <laughs> what the word was that Jesus used originally. And I don't know why I assume that, because often, whenever you speak another language, my uh, uh, my wife's my wife's family is is Mennonite, so they speak Low German. And sometimes I sit around the, at the family gathering, and I don't understand anything that's being said. But they have some words that they need to use from English because they don't have a Low German word for it. And so I'll be listening to them, and all of a sudden, deep freeze comes out, <laughs> and that's the freezer. And they don't have a Low German word uh, for it, so they just say deep freeze. So. Uh, today I'm just going gonna, gonna to take you on a little bit of a translation trail, and we're going to start with the word blessed. And the thing that we have to remember is that when Jesus is speaking, he's speaking in probably Aramaic uh, with some Hebrew, and, and then there, our scripture that we read uh, was translated from uh, the Greek, and the Greek is this... Uh, what was spoken largely around the time. So Jesus is in a small area where they speak Aramaic, and uh, in the wider world, uh, to the west of him, they speak mostly Greek. And so they made it so that people could understand it in their own language, and so they translated it to Greek. But uh, <clears throat> Jesus is pulling from, or as the kids might have said a while ago, riffing off of um, some, some Old Testament, uh, some Old Testament forms of talking. And so the word blessed is uh, how Jesus uses it, and following the translation trail comes from a Hebrew word called ashrei. And I'm just going to use, show you a few examples in the Old Testament of how the word ashrei is used. So in Deuteronomy 33, 29, it says, Ashrei are you, Israel, who is like you, a people saved by the Lord. He is your shield and helper and your glorious sword. Your enemies will cower before you, and you will tread on their heights. In 1 Kings 10, 8, the Queen of Sheba says to King Solomon, How ashrei your people must be. How ashray your officials who continually stand before you and hear your wisdom. In Proverbs 16.20, Whoever gets, gives heed to instruction prospers, and ashray is the one who trusts in the Lord. And one of the uh, famous controversial verses, Psalm 137.8-9, uh, Daughter Babylon, doomed to destruction, ashray is the one who repays you according to what you have done to us. Ashrei is the one who seizes your infants and dashes them against the rocks. So that's some Old Testament examples. Um, and then there's another example I want to use. Uh, it comes from the wisdom of Ben Sira. And this is uh, about a 200 BC uh, document that was very commonly used and referenced in Jesus' time. And it says, Ben Sira writes, There are nine who come to mind as Ashrei, a tenth whom my tongue proclaims the man who finds joy in his children, and the one who lives to see the downfall of his enemies. Ashrei, the man who lives with a sensible woman, and the one who does not plow with an ox and donkey combined. Ashrei, the one who does not sin with the tongue, who does not serve an inferior. Ashrei, the one who finds a friend who speaks to attentive ears. How great is the one who finds wisdom, but none is greater than the one who fears the Lord. So that's a wisdom document. That's not the Bible. Um, not referencing as the Bible, but you start to get an idea of how ashray is being used. If you looked, if you're paying attention <laughs> to these references in the Old Testament and the extra biblical text, you'll notice that many, though not quite, or if you'd read them before, you'd notice that many of them are translated as blessed, but not quite all of them. 
but also that none of them refer to the act of someone praying for God to bless someone else, or the act of God blessing someone, or the pronouncement of blessing, saying, God bless you. Because that is actually an entirely different Hebrew word. That is the Hebrew word, Baruch. So how, then, does Ashrei differ from Baruch? Ashrei is the labeling of someone who is experiencing a good life, or someone who is fortunate, or someone who is happy. So some of the different translations I've heard of Ashrei, and you can see this with the word blessed, too, is that we might label someone, <clears throat> you could totally do that, you could say, this person has been blessed by God. But it's different than calling and saying, God bless you, a pronouncement of God's blessing. And the Hebrew differentiates between these. So some of the other translations are, happy are those, the good life is for those, or fortunate are those. And I would, one of the English phrases that actually sticks out most to me is the idea of saying, someone has it made. So someone's got a, a you know, a happy life, they have it made. Um, they got a cabin at the lake and a boat. Um, they got it made. So I want you to input that refined meaning into the first word of each of the Beatitudes. Ashre is the one who is poor in spirit. The first part of each of these statements is not a statement about people who are blessed by God. This is a statement of people who are living the good life, who are happy. It's per somebody else viewing them and saying, these are people who are happy. And if that starts to seem a little strange, you get that Jesus is doing something really strange here. He's saying something that feels alien to the people who are listening. Poor in spirit is another interesting... Uh, the Hebrew word for spirit is ruach, which doesn't just refer to a metaphysical reality like a soul, but refers both to the wind and life of someone, someone's breath. You can see how they're actually intimately connected. So, for instance, in the Valley of Dry Bones, you know, so Ezekiel, he's, there's all these bones here, they come into flesh. Um, the Ruach, he calls, is the wind that comes and rustles the bones, but then it also fills them with life. And so it becomes the breath that are in them. So the, the he, in the Hebrew language, you connect the breath of a human with also the wind. So it's, this, uh, it's like this invisible kind of energy. Um, and so it can refer to what we would often refer to as spirit now, but it can also refer to um, wind and kind of in-between, which you wouldn't normally think of there's an in-between, but in the Hebrew language you would think that there's, they're connected. So <clears throat> Tim Mackey of the Bible Project would describe Ruach as an invisible energy. Um, and so when you look at this, poor or impoverished, impoverished of life, impoverished of ability, of energy. Um, Luke simply has the first line of his Beatitudes read, poor. Being poor in spirit, when I first read this for the first many years of, well, yeah, for the first years of my life, I would always think of it as just humble. I would think, oh, there's meek three verses later. That means humble. This means humble. Jesus is just repeating himself. <laughs> Whatever. Keep on moving on through. That's not what he's doing here. Being poor in spirit isn't something you aspire to be. It is a position that you are in. And we're going to find that throughout these first three Beatitudes, is that in these first three specifically, this is, these are not positions that you aspire to be. They're not values to aspire to have. They are positions that you are in. So then, <clears throat> happy are those, or fortunate are those, who are poor in ability, who are lacking in life. That is a strange statement, <laughs> right? That is a strange statement. If you hear somebody say that, that seems very strange. On average, the teens who come to drop-in, especially in Morden, aren't teens who have their life put together. They aren't successful at school or in sports. They don't have families with money. They are struggling with mental health. These are the teens who come through our doors. Often we have teens who have been expelled or suspended. And oftentimes, they come because they want something more from life. They want some community. They want to have hope and comfort, whether they can always verbalize it or not. In a kingdom where you are at the bottom, the kingdom of heaven is instinctively more attractive. 
Happy are those who are poor in ability, poor in life, because they will inherit the kingdom of heaven. Because that, to me, is just a beautiful picture of what we are trying to do at YFC. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The second people who are living the good life, who have it made, are those who are mourning. We share today, or they're sharing today about some of the pain that's been in this congregation recently. And I'm still in the prayer me- emails too, and I weep with you guys at times. All right, I mourn with you. Happy are those who are mourning is not something that you would ever describe someone who is mourning as. Fortunate are those who are mourning is not something you would say. There are perhaps two or three primary senses in the Old Testament in which people mourn. The first is a typical sense of grieving in the face of loss, whether your personal loss or in the loss of a king or even the whole nation. We see in Job how he experiences the loss of his whole family and all his possessions, yet he is returned with double the possessions and more children. God providing comfort in the way only he can. But there is further removed loss. Long after Israel and Judah go into exile for disobeying God time and time again for breaking the covenant, the exiles return to a ruined city. And they rebuild the temple and the walls of Jerusalem, but it's not near as magnificent as it was before. And they mourn the loss then, not of the people that they lost, but of what they had in their kingdom, of the loss of God's favor, of the loss of the glory of Jerusalem, of the temple and its beauty. But God again in this provides ultimate comfort. He will provide the new Jerusalem, he promises, that is far greater than any that came before it. Read through Revelation. The loss is not final, and the future in the kingdom of heaven is greater than that in the past. There is tragedy in this world. You can see it on the news all the time, whether it's personal stories of trauma from abusive caregivers to genocides of whole people groups, there is pain. A little microcosm of this, I stumbled upon a story of the Kauai O'O bird. Who here has heard of the Kauai O'O bird? Okay. So in the 1980s, the Kauai O'O bird was still around. It, lives, it lived in Kauai, in Hawaii. It was only on that island. But eventually there was only one bird left. It was one male O'O, the only bird left of its kind in the whole world. And they recorded its bird call. And you can listen to it online if you Google it. It's called The Last Call of the Kauai O'O. He is making a call to, his, to a mate, to a female O'o, but it is a call that will never, ever be answered because there's no female O'o's left. He is the last one. And when he died, the last of the O'o's died. That's one that isn't perhaps as heart-wrenching to us because it's just an animal. But that last lonely call of the OO is a microcosm of this world. Humans cannot repair the damage. We can use our money, time, and relationships to try to distract, ignore, but we can't fix it. If you remove God from this world, the idea that happy are those who mourn because they will be comforted makes no sense. In a godless world, those who mourn cannot truly be comforted. But with God, there is a new heaven and a new earth. And in the kingdom of heaven, those who mourn will be comforted, both in the future and in the fact that the future is coming and in their relationship with God. This is what we want to offer our teens at YFC. Comfort in the fact that their sorrows are not the final say in their life, that God has more to offer, a greater and better future. We have teens who have lost father and mothers to death, addiction, divorce, who never knew them from birth. That is not the final say in their life. We can offer them Christ, the ultimate comforter. We can introduce them to a new father. 
The final line we engage with today is, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. What is Jesus referring to with the term meek? More than all the others, this one has an incredibly clear hyperlink to Psalm 37. Psalm 37, 10 to 11 reads, A little while, and the wicked will be no more. Though you look for them, they will not be found. But the meek will inherit the land and enjoy peace and prosperity. Just like how the English words humble, humiliate, and humility are all connected, but they all have very different connotations, so does the Hebrew word. So the Hebrew word in Psalm 37, 10 to 11, about 7 of 20 times the NIV will translate this word to mean humble, another 8 times to mean poor or afflicted, and the leftover times as helpless, meek, needy, and oppressed. The other translation trail from the Greek word that's used in the Beatitudes to the Hebrew word, it traces the Hebrew word ani. Words like poor are used half the time, and the rest of the time the words are afflicted, oppressed, humble, needy, helpless, those who suffer, weak. These are people who are meek not because they want to be meek, These are people who are meek because they are forced into this position. The good life is for, or happier those, or those who have made it, are those who are poor, afflicted, oppressed, humble, needy, and helpless. How is that ashray? The humility not taken upon oneself, but more often than not forced upon you by others. Nobody who experiences that considers themselves fortunate. But Jesus says they are fortunate. Why? Because they will inherit the land. This went off like a light bulb in my head when I heard this. It seems so strange to me that humble people were inheriting the land. It was like, that is cool, but what is the connection between humility and inheriting the land? But if you're talking about the afflicted and the poor who throughout all of history have struggled with land ownership, who have not had anything in their name, now they will inherit the land. Not to mention, who is Jesus talking to? Jesus is talking to a bunch of Galileans who are the backwater of the Roman province of Judea, which is the backwater (laughs) of the Roman Empire. It's on a frontier. And not only that, their land, when they were conquered by the Roman Empire, it was handed all over, a great deal of it, to foreign investors, to Romans or Greeks who now own their land and they work on the land. If you think of the stories of landowners or tenants throughout the New Testament, Jesus is talking about realities that these people are used to. The tenant goes on a long, or the landowner goes on a long trip back to Cyprus or Italy. He's only going to come back in a few years and check on you. These people do not get to own land very often, especially not land for industry. But Jesus says that the afflicted, the humble, the oppressed, the poor people will inherit the land. They will experience prosperity. We have teens who come into YFC who don't have birth certificates. We have helped teens get birth certificates to YFC. They don't know how to work because no one has ever shown them to or how to. They don't have a way to get to work. They don't know how to talk to adults. They don't have good food on their plate. We show them what the upside down kingdom is like. We help them get birth certificates. We help them learn how to work. We teach them how to have real relationships with adults that isn't toxic. I specifically remember we used to have a program in Morden where we would visit families that we knew personally were struggling with food security. Um, and we'd have this, this bunch of stuff from co-op that was about to go bad, and we'd load it up in our vehicle, and so and we'd take it, and we'd sort through the fruit to make sure we got the good fruit, stuff like that, and we'd bring it there to these families. And I remember pulling up to one house, and this little boy comes out of the house, And there were other things in there. I was thinking of, if I was a kid, I kind of had in my mind what I thought he would pick. Maybe some yogurt, maybe some 
I think maybe there was chocolate milk in there or stuff like that. The boy picks through for some fruit. I think it was pears. He just wanted a couple pears because he didn't get fruit at home. So even though we've passed on that program to others now, we have instead, we started a program, we're developing it, uh, where we teach teens how to grow their own food, where we teach teens how to cook. We have a supper club program. We want teens to know the reality of an upside-down kingdom. This has to be attached to the good news. This isn't just about the here and now, but it clearly also isn't just not about the here and now either. So I just want to reread this first introduction to the kingdom of heaven, the first introduction that we get in Matthew. Happy are those who are lacking in life or ability, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Fortunate are those who are mourning, for they will be comforted. Those who are humble, afflicted, poor, and oppressed, they have it made because they will inherit the land. Jesus says something radical when he comes to describe the kingdom of heaven. As you go through the rest of the Beatitudes, it will be more about how you act. Hunger and thirst for righteousness, merciful, pure in heart, peacemakers, But this first bit is looking at the people who don't have. This is what we believe at YFC. We seek to engage with at-risk and vulnerable youth and humbly present them with the gospel of Christ. If you want to support any of the YFC workers, I know so many of you do already, or if you want to support The Rock in the future at the barbecue, and thank you so much for the support that you've already given through the garage sale. So many of you supported so much, and so I want you to know this is what we do. This is what your support goes to. But I also want us to examine our own lives. Is the gospel that we live out in our daily life, the gospel that we believe and proclaim, is that a gospel that's generally appealing to those who lack, to the mourning and to the afflicted? Because if it isn't, it isn't the gospel of Christ. Enjoy the kingdom of heaven and invite the poor of spirit, those that are mourning and those that are afflicted into it. because they will be comforted and they will inherit the land. I'd just like to pray now. Father, we are grateful that you see us when we are not at our best, when you receive us, when we don't have everything figured out. Yet it is so easy for us to put burdens on others. To ask them to have it figured out before they come to you. To look down upon those who aren't like us. Please help us to see people the way you do. To invite those who lack an ability or in life. To share your good news with those who are mourning. And to receive those who are afflicted and oppressed and share with them the good news that they will inherit the land. But also not to leave that into the future, but help us to share the bounty that we have now with those around us. May we just have a mindset of your abundance, Lord. You have it all and it's yours. Help us to remember that.